All right, welcome back to year two of the No Quarter Given podcast. Can you believe we are already, it is football season. We are in the heart of training camp. We're in week two of the NFL preseason. We're about uh, three weeks from Sunday away when we're recording this podcast from the Bucks kicking off Sunday night football in Dallas against the Dallas Cowboys. We are here t- this week. We're going to give you guys a great training camp edition of the No Quarter Given podcast. I am back for year two with my tag team partner, Mr. Peter Blake of the Sports Web. Welcome back, Mr. Blake, for year number two. I'm telling you, it's about time, right? I mean, it's football season. Everybody's been waiting for it. It's been one of the craziest off seasons of all time with Tom Brady, of course, retiring and then coming back and then B.A. retiring and a new coach and all these moves and free agency around the NFL. So let's get it started. Let's do it. Yeah, we've got some we got we got some big news around the league. The Deshaun Watson suspension finally adjudicated, and the reason that's relevant to the Buccaneers is the last game of his suspension is the game the Buccaneers play the Cleveland Browns that weekend, and he's eligible to come back the next day. So we're the we're game eleven of the suspension for Deshaun Watson. He got suspended eleven games, fined five million bucks. So we'll we'll be the last game to either see Jacoby Brissett. Maybe Jimmy Garoppolo or whoever else, whoever the hell else is quarterback in the Cleveland Browns at that point. So we're going to avoid Deshaun Watson, which is a uh, you know can be debated to be a good or bad thing. But we're gonna what we're gonna do tonight, folks, is we're gonna go through each position group on the on the roster, the the training camp roster. We're gonna tell you guys we think you know obviously there are lots of locks that we know are gonna make the team, but we're gonna try to bring up a name or two from each position group that we like. Maybe comes a guy comes out of nowhere, maybe to make the team. We're also, when we're done with our position groups, we are going to break down historically some unheralded guys that the Buccaneers have have either signed in training camp or draft undrafted free agents or late round draft picks that have made big impacts both for the Buccaneers and other teams in the NFL throughout their career. So we're going to take you back in the history books a little bit with some big name players that have made big impacts in the NFL and they started their career here as, as unheralded players with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. You're ready to go, Mr. Blake? I'm ready to go. I mean, this is what we do here on the No Quarter Given Podcast. We go through the history of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, and we never sleep. It doesn't matter what's going on, especially preseason. We'll give you the history of your Tampa Bay Buccaneers. You and again, we want to thank uh, BuckPower.com for, for being our podcast host, Mr. Paul Stewart. You got to go anything Buck history related stats, video, players. When did they play? How long did they play? Highlights. Go to buckpower.com. Your unofficial Buccaneer historical websites. Unbelievable how much work Paul puts into it. Paul's going to be contributing to us on our week on our podcast throughout the year. He's going to give us a little four or five minute, in his words, historical audio clips, things like that throughout the year. So we're going to have a new little feature this year as part of uh, the No Quarter Given podcast as we preview and and, and do a review of the Buccaneers last week opponent and this week's opponent. But Paul's going to provide us an awesome little four or five minute uh, historical review of who who the Buccaneers opponent. So we're going to start it, kick it off with the Dallas Cowboys when we preview that, that, that game in week one. So let's get right to it. Quarter, let's start QBs, the, 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 the news of the week. Mr. Tom Brady's been on a little vacation. Sounds like a little family vacation with with Giselle and the kids from what it sounds like. Um, Interesting news coming out of Todd Bowles' press conference today up in Nashville. He's not quite sure when Tom Brady's coming back. There was talk that he would be back right after the Tennessee game, i.e. Sunday or Monday of next week. Now there's a little bit of indecision of we're not sure yet. We think he'll be back. Your general thoughts, Peter Blake. Uh, well, I don't know what to think. I mean, because I've been asked about this all day long when it got announced and I'm thinking, you know, is this a big deal? Does it become even more of a big deal if he doesn't show up? (laughs) And, you know, what's the time limit on this? And, you know, at the end of the day, I didn't think it was a really a big time story because at the end of the day, it's Tom Brady. He's the greatest of all time. Do you really need him to play in any of these preseason games? Most likely not. But now you hear something totally different, so I'm really not sure what to think. I say at the end of the day, you know, he's the greatest of all time. It's Tom Brady. He's going to come back when he wants to come back. The Bucks know what's going on. They're a 
an unbelievable organization. They had this planned out. It's maybe being made a, a too much of a big deal at this right. juncture. I think you're going to see Brady by midweek next week. I, it, it, you know, he may not be there Monday, but I would guess by Wednesday or Thursday at the latest next week that you'll see Tom. It'll have been a, you know, it will have been a solid two weeks that he's been away from the team. Whatever vacation they've probably, if they've had a pre prearranged family vacation, most of the time it lasts 10, 11 days. When you go on some, they might be out of the country for all we know. Who knows? But you know, obviously their kids got to go back to school too. So. I don't know if, again, they've got kids, so that school's starting here in the state of Florida, so they can't be gone too long. They're not going to be missing a bunch of schools. So who knows what the deal is, but and I think by Wednesday. The Bradys, you know, the Bradys do whatever they want to. That's how it goes. But <laughs> I ask you this, if it goes longer than next week, then as a Bucks fan, you know, do you start to become a little bit concerned and say, well, maybe Brady is having, you know, second thoughts. Yeah. There's no way. There's no way Tom Brady pulls the rug on the Buccaneers at this stage. Right. That would be a major tarnish on him, his legacy. That he if he pulled the plug in a week before the regular season starts, says I'm retired. That would be bad, bad look for Tom Brady and his brand. I don't think there's any chance of him doing that. Well, what people will justify is they will say, well, you know, the Bucs have had all these injuries now to their offensive line, Ryan Jensen being gone. So nah. we may be concerned about the offensive line, but that doesn't make any sense. Even without Gronk and somewhat of a new offensive line at the end of the day, you still have weapons. You still recruited a Julio Jones. Right. Uh, you still had, you know, a Shaq Mason that's on the offensive line. You still asked Carlton Davis and Leonard Fournette to come back. So, it's not in the Tom Brady mindset, in my opinion. I don't think it's going to happen, but I think there's a lot of Bucks fans right now that are concerned about this situation. They want to watch it play out, and we're going to do that here on the No Quarter Given podcast. We're going to see how this plays out. Right. I think, you, like you said, you most likely you're right about this. It's going to be you know, uh, the middle of the week, and everybody's going to forget about this, or people are going to continue to harp on it because they want to have you know things to talk about in this off season. two questions I want to ask about the quarterback position. Yes. What do they do with what? What do we? What do the Buccaneers do with Ryan Griffin? He's the fourth guy, clearly the fourth guy. Gabbert's entrenched as the two. What do you do with Ryan Griffin? Do you release him? Do you try to trade him? Do you keep four quarterbacks? He's been around nine years now. Never played really a, a, a regular season down. Can you afford to waste a roster spot with a fourth quarterback? No, you cannot. And I was surprised uh, why he was on the team in the first place. But look, you know, this may go back to what was being talked about, that the Bucks knew that Tom Brady was going to be out for a while. So that's why right. you carry an extra quarterback. Maybe, yep. The reason why you carry a Griffin is because he knows the offense at the end of the day. Now, is he going to get some maybe some looks look sees from other teams? That's certainly possible. I don't see him making the team. I would rather see Kyle Trask, Blaine Gabbard, especially Trask. The more reps you can get him, the more you can figure out if this man is the future quarterback of the Bucks. You got, and we had if Bucks fans had to be encouraged by Week One performance in the preseason by Trask. Played pretty well. He oh, made uh, some mistakes, but right, he right. but he showed some command, showed some poise. Got the Bucks in position at the end of the game for a field goal. I think you were encouraged if you're a Buck fan in year two with Kyle Trask. I think you were too, but not at first. I mean, the turnover, the ill-advised throw there to Rashard White, you can't have that happen. Yep. Either take the sack or get out of the pocket because he's got some mobility and throw the ball away. Easy uh, now. Right. Easy now. He ain't uh, Michael Vick. Easy he now. He ain't Michael Vick, but he's able to scale. <laughs> uh, you know, we, we seen it. I got you. The pocket. I you got know you. what I'm talking about. I know, I know you're being funny, man, there, and that's okay, Jason Powers, tag <laughs> partner of the world. Uh, and then the uh, sack, that's not his fault. That's an offensive line. That's a second or third string, but you're yep. exactly right. You got to like the moxie, if you will. <laughs> of Mr. Trask stepping up in those situations, making some critical throws, even if they are versus second and third stringers yep. at the end of the day, what you want to see is progression and development. And that's what you saw last Saturday night versus the Miami Dolphins. All right, let's go to the running back position. I, I you know, we know Fournette's the guy, um, Rashad, Rashad white. They really like, he's going to make this team. No doubt in my mind. The question is, what do you do with Keyshawn Vaughn and Gio Bernard? Do both guys make the roster? Does one guy make it? You really can't send Keyshawn Vaughn to the practice squad. He'll be gobbled up in a heartbeat. What do you do? I know Gio Bernard had a little injury in the first game. What do you do? Do you keep four running backs? Do you keep three? 
And of the three, which who's your third guy? Is it Vaughn or is it Bernard? Uh, I think it's going to be Vaughn at this point because he made an investment just a couple of years ago as a third round pick. And yep. once again, they have some value there. Uh, Giovanni Bernard has not been able to stay healthy. I get it. He's a veteran presence, has shown flashes of brilliance, but you can't make a team if you're not available. And right, right. now he's injured. So I think they're going to go with the younger guys, but don't be surprised. They may keep four running backs just to get, uh, again, you know, figure out what they're going to do. But I, I believe they like White as the second guy, as the third down option. And I also think that they have a lot invested in a Keyshawn Vaughn. So I can't see Gio making this team unless, again, they want to keep four. And he's not healthy. So to me, it's pretty easy at this point. It's academic. Then on top of it, they signed uh, Patrick Laird uh, as a running yep. back. So yeah, right. They're, they're going to get a look and they're again, they're going to look and see, they're going to figure out and evaluate right. what they have. But I think the guys you have to focus on for me, you're exactly right. White and Keyshawn Vaughn are the guys you're going to keep on this roster, in my opinion. And they're cheaper and younger. And the only, only, the only question you would have is, and again, you may see more Leonard Fournette on third down because pass protection, sure. third down pass protection is critical for, especially for Brady and the offensive line, potential issues that we're going to talk about. But third down back, that's where Geo kind of does a good job. But Rashad White's got really good hands out of the backfield too, so that may elim- that may eliminate Geo Bernard from the from the Buccaneer roster. So we'll see how that goes. And all I right. think that's the reason why you draft White in the first place because he can do all those things that Geo can do, and maybe he could do better than a Vaughn because at the end of the day, you drafted Vaughn in the third round. He's supposed to be giving you what White can right now. Right. You kind of wonder, you know, is he are, are they kind of you know trying to push the buttons, if you will, of a Keyshawn Vaughn to push him to do better because they drafted White in the third round. So you have two third round running backs. Yep. One of those guys has to do a better job when it comes to pass protection and catching the ball consistently. And I know it's a small sample size, but what you saw from college and also on yep. Saturday night from White, it's pretty impressive. No, I agree. I think he showed a burst and all that stuff. All right, let's go to the wide receiver core. Locks to make it. Obviously, Evans, Chris Godwin, Russell Gage, Julio Jones. So that's four right there. At most, you're keeping six on the active roster at most. So that leaves guys that we need to talk about. Tyler Johnson, Scotty Miller, Brashard Perriman, Cyril Grayson, Jalen Darden. Which of those, I mean, who do you who do you prioritize of those five of those four or five guys that have the best opportunity to make it and stick? And you didn't even talk about Stearns. And didn't even well, we're going about- to get to that. We're going to get to them. But I'm just talking about the, the veteran guys that have got experience that, you know, all those guys are not making this roster. No, they're not. And it's a tough, it's a good problem to have if you're the Tampa Bay Buccaneers and you like, you have to like the way Tyler Johnson played the other night. So if he continues to play like that and the camp that he's playing, I think right. he's a spot on this team. I think the odd man out is Scotty Miller, and this is why you draft Jalen Darden last year, what, in the fourth round? Right. He's got the same speed component. It looks like progressively he's gotten better in this second year of camp. Right. And Scotty Miller still looks like he doesn't fit in this offense, although look. He's at a one-trick Rocks. pony. Right. One-trick and, pony. Right. I mean, there's potential there. You've seen it in game situations, but he's not putting it all together. And at the end of the day, I think maybe Scotty Miller could be trade bait where they trade him and maybe get a pick or who knows, maybe get a backup center or get a player that can come in here and contribute and help this team win this year. This is one of the spot. This is probably one of the deepest rooms in the NFL. There's wow. probably literally seven to eight NFL quality wide receivers in this room, in this room, and only five or six are going to make it. You know, you got Brashad Perriman. He, somebody will pick him up if they release him. Scotty Miller will get picked up. Tyler Johnson would get picked up in a heartbeat. I mean, Darden would probably get picked up as a kick return kind of slot guy. A couple of names I want to talk about that had really good week one performances that I think could be sleepers to make the team. Definitely the practice squad, but maybe even the active roster. Jarrett Stearns showed some really good flashes. Hands. I loved how he high pointed that ball in the preseason for that touchdown. He's undersized, but he went up over that DB and high pointed the ball, made a great catch on the uh, Kyle Trask behind you know back shoulder throw yeah no absolutely he's definitely got an opportunity to make the team even though like you said you know it's a filled room so if he continues to play like that then again this team is going to have some tough decisions uh to make and 
like you said, they can put him on the practice squad, but if he shows enough tape out there, there are going to be teams that are going to be interested to put him on yep. the roster right now. So yep. you know, that's kind of the conundrum, if you will, uh, with the uh, evaluation when it comes to preseason, especially you know this wide receiving room. And, and, and say what you want. The Buccaneers, I know they're freewheeling when it comes to salary cap, but if, if there's a way that you could save a million and a half bucks by keeping a Stearns and letting Tyler Johnson go or a Scotty Miller, you might need those dollars down midseason for a Gronk, for a Sue potentially if, if you had an injury problem or somebody like that, a veteran guy that you needed some salary cap space midseason where you're going to have to keep some younger guys. You can't have everybody making – a bunch of money. So, you know, Scotty Miller's in his fourth year. So he's at the peak of his rookie salary. As far as fourth year guy, Tyler Johnson, the same thing. You can replace him, get the same value out of Stearns. Who's now a, on a first year salary. If you can save a million bucks here and there, that opens up some salary cap room around the roster. It's a good point. And one of those wide receivers, if they can play special teams at the end of the day, that definitely gives them an advantage over everybody yep. else. Yeah, and I think I think Darden's advantage is he's probably going to be the kick returner. You want him to be the either the kick returner, maybe even the punt returner as well. So I think he's gonna. I think he's the most likely fifth guy to make it for sure. And if they, and the decision is whether they're going to keep six. And you know, to me, the decision probably comes down to Tyler Johnson and Stearns is probably the sixth guy. Wow, I think. Who do you like in that? You like Johnson or you like Stearns? I want to see more. I want to see the next two weeks, honestly. Okay. I want to see if Stearns can get off coverage playing against some of the better, you know, maybe this week they play, he plays against the number one or two corner. Let's see Stearns play a couple series against the one or twos and not the, not the threes. I like it. Okay. You're listening to the powers on, I mean, no quarter given podcast, not the powers on sports cut. That's another one. That, that is I do. another one. You're a big <laughs> fan. You're always working. <laughs> Peter Blake and I are breaking down the Buccaneer roster. We're going through every position group. Let's get to tight end. The big loss in the offseason, Gronk, no longer a Buccaneer for now. Like you and I have talked about, I think you're going to see Gronk around Halloween, personally. But right now in the room, you got Cam Brate's going to make it, Kyle Rudolph, Kate Otten, the three automatics. The question is, do they keep a fourth guy? I don't think so. I think they keep three. Um, what do you what do you what are your thoughts on Kate Otten? I know we have short sample size. Yeah. Do you like Kate Otten, the the rookie? And then obviously. Kyle Rudolph, veteran guy. We know what he is. He's not Gronk, but he's a solid player. Team him up with Brait. What do you think of the tight end room? Yeah, I like the tight end room a lot. And there's a reason why you drafted two tight ends in this draft. Not only a Cade Otten, but a Cole Keith. Cole Keith. Keith. Right. Both of those guys can not only catch the ball, but they can also block. So I think there's certainly an opportunity there to keep four. Of course, you could always put one on the practice squad, but for me, I, I like what the tight end room uh, has right now. Cam Braid, of course, it's always about can he stay healthy? Can he be productive? Right. Uh, Rudolph, I'm just going to, you know, he played for the New York Giants. The Giants offense is terrible. I'll give him the benefit of the doubt. Furthermore, has he ever played with a good quarterback? So you look at his statistics, still, you know, pretty reasonable, not playing with great quarterbacks. Maybe Kirk Cousins. That's yep. about Her, it. Yep. So you finally get a chance to play with Brady. Uh, you can also block somewhat. I mean, I'm not going to compare him to Gronkowski, but that's the reason why you get yeah. a Rudolph in the first place. You want him to block. And then, of course, Otten and and uh, Keith. So, uh, yeah, I think they could keep four. I mean, at, at the end of the day, maybe they drop off uh, one of the draft picks. Kate Otten makes this team. The other guy, eh, Keith, maybe he maybe he's on the practice squad. I think Keith, I think Keith goes – they're not putting Otten on the practice squad. He would get no. As a third-round pick, he'd get gobbled no. up. I think keeps the guy that gets put on the practice squad. Um, you're going to keep three tight ends. And then obviously you still have the door wide open for Gronk at some point if he wants to make a move. And again, there'll be some injuries. And, you know, who knows? Like you said, Brayton Rudolph has, don't have the greatest injury history. So yeah. there's probably going to be an opportunity if, if Gronk wants to play. And if Gronk wants to play, they'll find a way to get Gronk on the roster. Somebody will be gone. They'll yeah. do something. So they're going um, to figure out something. That's for sure. If yes. Gronk wants to be on this team, it'll be that much better. And, uh, even coming back in Halloween or the middle of the season, if you will, he's still one of the premier tight ends in the league. He showed that last year statistically. And then on top of it, you know, the percentage of plays uh, that he had in this offense what was it, like 77% right. along the lines of that. So he's an integral part 
of this offense because not only of his pass catching skills, but also what he can do in the run game. And he can act as another tackle with his in uh, line blocking techniques. Absolutely not. Again, I don't think you'll see as much production out of this position as far as on the field. But again, run blocking, you, you, you need some help in the run game and specialized red zone stuff. That's where I think you'll see Rudolph. If he's going to make an impact, it's going to be inside the 10 yard line kind of guy. So, but uh, all right. Offensive line. Again, this is an interesting. Uh, this is probably the most interesting part of this roster that we got to get straightened out again. No, remember, no Ryan Jensen. They've not put him on IR yet, but he's probably going to be on IR for probably at least eight, nine weeks, I would think. At the minimum, sounds like the injury's severe enough that it maybe isn't season ending, but it's going to be significantly period of time. Donovan Smith going to make it. Stinney, Hainsey, Shaq Mason, Tristan Wirfs. Those are your, probably your five starters. Then you've got backups. Let's talk about the. You typically keep eight eight active offensive linemen you typically keep another couple on the on the on the roster so you the question is do you keep josh wells back up you got the draft pick luke get he's gonna make it yep. okay you got nick leverett he's gonna make it because of his versatility garden center and then you got a kid john mulkin he got a lot of run at center last week does he, do they keep him around because of his versatility what are your thoughts on the backup offensive linemen I think you got to keep as many offensive linemen as possible because you do have some injuries. In fact, you had an injury today. Tristan Wirfs went out with a core injury. So, you okay. know, those can be lingering. And and th- that's probably the worst offensive lineman you can lose on this line. Yes. Your, so you're kind of worried about that. So to answer your question at this point, I think you're going to keep as many offensive linemen until it becomes, you know, known what they're going to do with Jensen. Most likely they're going to release Jensen. I'm worried about Worfs. Okay. I, again, I, again, we're recording this the Thursday night of the Buccaneers Titans practices in, in Nashville. So yeah, that's yeah. again, we don't know what the status of obviously Worfs won't play Saturday night, but uh, we don't know what the status of Worfs injury is. So we'll see how that goes. This is a position I could definitely see the Buccaneers making a couple roster moves when the when the all the other teams around the league cut their rosters down. This uh-huh. could be this this is where you could see a veteran lineman or two get brought in for some flexibility, maybe people that are familiar with the Bruce Arian system, maybe former Arizona guys, you never know, guys like that that have some familiarity with Tom Brady. Um so I could definitely see the Bucks making a move or two on the on the uh, after rosters are cut down from 90 to 53. Who do you think makes that or uh, that offensive line, the left guard situation? Who do you think wins out? And there's a kid that we, I think we've kind of forgotten about, and I'm trying to think of who it is. It's in practice. It's been really showing out. Okay. Uh, for them. And you got Sidari. You got other names: Sidarius Hutcherson, Brandon Walton, Brandon Dylan Walton. Cook. That's the name right there that everybody's kind of been surprised by. Is that a name where you would keep him because you do have a Tristan Wirfs injury and because your offensive line does have some depth issues? If he starts to, if he if, continues to play well, not only in practice, yeah. but also in game situations, is that a person or a player that you would keep? Again, you're going to see a lot of him these next two weeks to know if he can handle the NFL light, the NFL job as the position they're going to put him at. And again, I think this, these are the kind of spots where you get undrafted guys that make it. We're going to talk about some offensive linemen that have made it in the Bucks history, had great careers that have been undrafted guys. So we're going to, we're going to talk about that, but you know, if they really like him, definitely a practice squad guy for sure, but you never know. He could make the active roster. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. I mean, just, you never know in the national football league, not for long. You All right. This- Knocks, I mean, I think that is such a compelling story. People, don't watch it, but to me, it's compelling because there's always a guy that you least expect yeah. to make the team, and then you're following the other players around and you know hoping that they make the team. I, I think it's such a well done uh, deal by the National Football League. I yeah. always enjoy that. People say, "Ah, I hate preseason." I like preseason because you kind of evaluate, and you never know. There's a player that kind of sticks out that's not a high draft pick that can't. That's right. And I know we're going to talk about that a little bit later. I'm just saying it. I mean, there have been hall, there have been probably more Hall of Famers come out of the fourth and fifth round than first rounders or second round. I mean, so many Hall of Famers over the years have been third, fourth, fifth round draft picks. Undrafted guys have made the. I mean, so it's it's, it's not about where you're drafted; it's about what you do with your opportunity. 
You're exactly right. And I remember the Seattle Seahawks with their quarterback situation. They paid the guy out of Matt Flynn, LSU, Green Bay. They paid him a big time contract. And then you draft Russell Wilson in the third round. Yep. And then Russell Wilson is going to be a Hall of Famer, probably. Right. Your starting quarterback and goes on to the next couple of years, take you to the playoffs, win a Super Bowl. Uh, of course, you know, on the strength of the defense and Marshawn Lynch, but still playing well. But who saw that happening in the preseason, a third round quarterback? I mean, it, it's just it, it's really it was unheard of back then and, and still kind of unheard of these days, unless you're a bad team and you want to throw a guy right to the fire right away. All right, let's talk before we get to the defense. Let's talk special teams. My wheelhouse. You know me. I love the kickers and the punters, man. Oh, right. we got some talk. To, we get we got some talking to do here because I I had to get your thoughts about Saturday night. Okay, we're gonna okay. So let's let's start. Jake Camarda, drafted punter out of Georgia, I think in the fourth round. You know they've got rid of Pinion, which we talked about. Pinion didn't have a very good year last year. They're gonna save a bunch of money on the salary cap with Pinion uh, to go to Camarda. You know Camarda had a shaky start, but then he punted better later in the game. Again, he's a rookie punter. Is he gonna is he gonna kick the ball fifty yards every time? No, but you want consistency. You want to you know salary cap wise, you want an inexpensive punter that doesn't kill you. Good, he's a kickoff guy too, so that take that takes off the pressure off a of suck up or Borgalis, and then he can hold too. So I think he's gonna be a he he'll be fine. Will he have some ups and downs as as a rookie punter? Like they all do. So um, most of them do at least. So I'm not worried about Camarda again. Um, be consistent. Don't drop the ball. Do what you're supposed to do, holding the ball, and be a good kickoff guy. No, I agree. And, again, he had a rough start, but you, you, it's not how you start. It's how you finish. And, of course, he is going to be the starting punter for this team. You don't draft a guy in the fourth round to sit right. on the bench or be behind Bradley Pinion. Of course, Pinion is no longer a part of this team, and it comes down to, you know, field advantage and, and, and field position. Yep. That's so important for a uh, defense. Uh, like the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, and they felt like they were lacking. So I understand it. Hopefully, it pays off. Yep. Uh, but yeah, here's a here's a sneaky thing about Camarda. Yes, he had a tremendous baseball career as a high school kid. Great athlete, can run, can move. Don't be surprised if the Buccaneers run a fake punt with him throwing the ball because of his baseball background. So again, that just gives you one more versatility to be able to do something like that. If you decide to run a trick play with the punt team, he's got the athleticism to run or throw based on his background. Or maybe sign with the Tampa Bay Rays because they have so many entries. <laughs> maybe he's a good pitcher. There yeah. you go. He'll, he'll fit right in with Stu Sternberg. Keep oh, it cheap. cheap. Keep it right. cheap, baby. Keep it there, cheap. There you go. Exactly. See, we've, we've solved the Rays problems. We're solving <laughs> all the Bucks problems and everything like that. I mean, and this is what you get here on the No Quarter Given podcast on the Buck Power. Right. Uh, dot com network. All right. Let's talk place kicker. Yeah. There was a real opportunity, in my opinion, for Borgales to put some pressure on Suck Up if he'd have made the game winner Saturday night against the Dolphins. Got a big leg. We know, you know, he had a big career at, at, at Miami and FIU, strong leg. The Bucks like him. He's got a much stronger leg than than suck up, but ultimately, are you going to put a championship team on the leg of a rookie kicker who the one time he's had an opportunity to kick a game winner came up woefully bad? Not a good kick. It's not like he was a good kick that that just missed. It was and trust me from a guy that is, was a former kicker. Even though that ball hit the upright, that was a horrendous kick at the most pressurized time. Agree. And I've heard from uh, a good buddy uh, by the name of J.C. Allen, a pewter report, who said he's done this in practice. He's had some good practices, but when he's missed, he's missed off the upright. So Bad. In, in, unless he gives you an advantage with his foot. But, you know, the Bucks have been down this road before, right? I yes. mean, they've had kickers that, you know, have great leg strength, and it doesn't always work out. You know why? Because they're not accurate. So – to your point, I think it's going to be very tough to beat out a Ryan Suckup, but if this kid kicks lights out and he gives them an advantage, well, who knows? Uh, he may. I, have to, I, I think that was. I think that was his opportunity Saturday night really? to put a lot of pressure on Suckup. He's done. I don't know if he's done. I don't think he's going to beat him out. I think he can. He might. They might keep him on the practice squad potentially. Right. Right. But I coach kickers, high school kids, and I tell them all: it ain't about how long. It ain't sure if you have a strong leg, that's great. But it ain't about strong leg. And I'm going to give the, the viewers that are watching us on the uh, YouTube channel, the only thing that matters is when the referee does this. 
Right. They don't care that it, you can kick at 75 yards, which he was claiming he could make a 75-yard field goal on the broadcast, on the preseason broadcast. It's about the referee putting his hands up and not across his body for no good at the, at the, at the money time. You being a coach of kickers, what did he do wrong on that kick, in your opinion? Bad swing. And it's pressure. Pressure. It's it's easy. I don't say it's easy. It's much easier to kick balls when you're at practice, when there's nothing on the line. But when there's 40,000 people in a preseason game and it's the last play of the game, that's pressure. It's not the same pressure as the second quarter. He roped a 54-yarder, which was a nice kick. But that wasn't for the, all the marbles. When all the marbles are on the line in the fourth quarter, Suckup has a very good history of making them. I'm convinced. You convinced. And the and the Buccaneers cannot risk losing a game or two this year by a by a rookie kicker. Oh, I agree. Because we've seen again, we've seen that before. I mean, it's the curse of Matt Bryant, right? And then you get Ryan Suckup, who He's, you know, his accuracy went down last year. Yep. He had a phenomenal year in their Super Bowl, uh, you know, uh, journey, but. And I would say this, would it shock me if the Bucks cut suck up and signed another guy, a veteran guy that got cut somewhere else? No, I, I mean, there's, I'm not, I'm not guaranteeing suck up is going to be the guy, but what, what I like about suck up is, you know, from probably 48 yards and in, he's pretty solid. He, sure. He's going to miss a kick here and there. Yes. But he's got a history of making kicks and especially late fourth quarter kind of kicks that you got to have. Is that where the Bucs are looking at this point, Jason, is because he is so limited with his range that they're looking to – Potentially. Right. I think if Borgallis would have crushed that ball game winner Saturday night and had a great preseason, you'd have had more confidence in potentially rolling the dice with him. But missing that kick the way he does, did, I don't think he's going to make it as far as on the active roster. I think they'll keep him on the practice squad because I don't know if anybody else is going to pick him up immediately. But I think he'll be a valuable guy to have in case suck up gets hurt or struggles uh, during the year. So that's, that's where I see the kicking situation going. Good point. All right. We're going to take a quick break. We're going to be right back just a minute with the defense. We're, we're on the no quarter given podcast, part of the buckpower.com podcast network. And we're going to be right back in just a minute to go over all things defense and the best undrafted and late round draft picks in bucks history. We'll be right back. 